And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Some of you may know him as the Archon, some of you may know him as the man of a thousand spreadsheets, some as the developer of Ascendant, and others as the developer of Adventure Conqueror King System, which is which is making its grand return with, through the Imperial imprint. The one and only Alexander Macris. How are you doing today, hey, man? Hey, thanks for having me back on the show. How are you? Thanks for coming on. Here, have a spreadsheet. <laughs> Thank you. That meme will Thank never you. die. I have, I, I have enough. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, I'd like to, s I'd like to say you have, you have enough, but, um, Role Master exists. Well, look, I, I, I admire Role Master. It's a well-designed game, but, um, you know, the level of crunch in Role Master is probably one step past even what I enjoy. So I don't, uh, I don't see myself in competition with them for that prize. They're, they're welcome to it. Yeah. I, um, I just, I just have to make that j joke because... Whenever, whenever I see somebody complaining about a, about a given game being about games being too complicated, especially more um, ubiquitous entries, I usually end up laughing because I've seen where the I've seen where the um, bottom of the well is, or the, how deep the rabbit hole goes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, like the original Traveler actually had physics equations in it. Yeah, so. and um, because I've hit. Be it's funny you mention that because since I've hit a certain threshold, I have to, I have to fulfill a promise, and that in, and that's going to involve me covering um, Traveler Five. Mm -hmm. I have been putting that off for years for a, for a reason. <laughs> I don't know anything about Traveler Five, honestly. Um, it is yeah, chart heavy. I've heard, I've heard it's pretty intense, though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because I've. A while back, I put it up to a poll about whether or not I'd cover Mongoose Traveler or Traveler Five. Mm -hmm. uh, and ev even that, I was I was hesitant about because I would have to find a way to summarize Traveler's um, history of system jumping in less than five minutes. Yeah, yeah, no, which that's right. can it be done? Yes, can it be done easily? Mm, jury's out on that. Right. Yeah, you know, I so I started with Starter Traveler. So um, I had the original Starter Traveler box set, and then I sort of grew into the other portions of the um, classic Traveler. And mm -hmm. I have a bunch of the books for Mongoose Traveler as well. I think Traveler is really well designed. I should check out Traveler 5th Edition at some point and see um, see what it's like. You know, you I, I've heard crazy things about it, so I don't I don't know really what to expect. It's, in, it's intended to be kind of a retro clone of earlier editions, from what, from uh -huh. what I've been told. Um, right. However, it does annoy it does annoy me that you have two you have two whenever you have two games of the sa of the same name um re well relatively same name by two different sets of d designers. So right. it so and I th I remember I remember I remember making this remark about about um about say eight about say the Myriad of of O D and D versions that e that exist, oh. <laughs> and tr and trying to fig trying to figure out which one is which for somebody jumping into things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you have the sure. you have the different version, you have the different edits. Then you have then you have mul then you have um B X. Then you have Be then you have Beck Me. Then you have Rules Cyclopedia. I mean, yep. for those who have been, for those who have been inundated in it, that's not going to be that much of an issue. No, it, it's not an issue for people that are sort of in the space. I think if you're looking from outside the space and you see all these different options, and there's also all the different retro clones, each of which is doing some variant of one of those options, and it can create, um, you know, analysis paralysis. And I think that's probably why a lot of people, um, you know, just end up going with fifth edition because they know it, it's comfortable and doesn't, you know, they can always find a player group, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we, those of us in the OSR definitely have our work 
cut out for us um, in marketing to people. Mm. Although I'd, s I've um, I've been very I've been very public about my my disassociation with a lot of a, a, a large amount of the OS a large amount of the OSR mostly be, mostly because of a certain ha a certain um habit that a lot of, that a lot end up having um it's in, essentially having essentially falling into the um debate about the right way to do things yep um uh, also known as um bad wrong fun yeah yeah exactly exactly but now, when it com when it comes to the Imperial imprint, mm -hmm. um, I think I remember I think I remember rumblings about about it before January, but I didn't hear I didn't hear it really get kicked off because, from what I understand, you had you had pondered it, um, shortly after you made Ascendant, um, simply because you wanted to make something a little do something a little less crunchy, <laughs> uh, after do after um do after doing Ascendant. And needed and needed a bit of a palate cleanser, and then the OGL fiasco happened, and that kind of accelerated things. Yeah, it both accelerated things and slowed things down because I had to do an enormous amount of work to remove it from the OGL. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, you know, I don't know if it was I. It, I don't know if I would say it was an accelerant. It was certainly a catalyst that um, forced my hand. You know, up until then, I think I would have been. Um, Content to just do, you know, a consolidation of what I'd written and republish it, and um, and this really forced my hand into a complete, a complete rewrite. So, yeah. But that said, I was still able to maintain backwards compatibility, so I'm I'm pleased with that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the th one of the big things that I did notice is that it it looks like um. It looks like what what's being done with imprint is. Aside from aside from weeding out some of the o OGL material, also um, bringing bringing some of the things that were in expansions into the into the core book. Um, the I'd say I'd say the big the big one that I noticed, unless unless I miss unless I miss um, read things, is bringing bringing some of the mass combat in that was presented in Domains at War. That's correct. So the entirety of Domains at War campaigns, which is the system for raising armies, maneuvering armies, supplying armies, uh, and then having abstract battles with those armies, is all brought right into the revised rulebook. The only part of Domains at War that is not in the revised rulebook is the tabletop miniature game. Mm -hmm. Which is cer certainly f certainly fair because I think th I think trying to bring um, that part as well would make th would make things a little bit. A little bit, a little bit ridiculous, and domains at war is already was already a pretty beefy um, book as it was. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly, and and things have been beefed up a lot. So mm -hmm. I didn't. I the number of people that have used domains at war is relatively small compared to the number of people that have used um, uh, all of the other components of Axe. So I didn't want to force people to get into the tabletop miniature side if they don't want to. I'll probably update it, and it's certainly going to be there as an option for people that want it. But, um, but you know, uh, most folks um, seem to prefer to use the more abstract system because um, they're not war gamers. It's probably like sixty six thirty three. Yeah, I could I could see that. Yeah. Oh. When it comes to now, the, when it comes to some of the other some of the other things that were were um were part of were part of the core, were part of the core lineup, I am, there's a few that I am curious if that's gonna get if those are gonna get folded in. Um, one of one of them is Guns of War, which if if that doesn't get folded in, I can completely understand it. So Guns of War is not going to get folded in. I will probably go, revert to do Guns of War again in the future, mm -hmm. um, but it won't get folded into the main game now. All right. Um, now you may you may recall. I'm not sure if you recall when I did the review of of Axe all those years ago. Um, one of the things I said it the overall assessment I had was that it was good, but I always recommended people to try and get a package of the core book and the player's companion. In order to um, fully realize its potential, 
a big reason why I brought up the Player's Companion was the class creation system that you had, which for mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. for a lot of a lot of OSR retro clone, whatever you want to call it, that kind of thing is unprecedented. Like I, even to this day, I still haven't seen anybody um, try that. Yeah, nobody else does that, and all of that material has been consolidated and placed into the judges' journal. So you get race creation, class creation, magic creation, spell creation, and then in the monstrous manual, there's monster creation. Yeah. So um, it, it's all there. You know, we open up the hood and let you see everything. It's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Which it is so is something that I appreciate because. Again, with that whole with that whole bad with that whole bad wrong fun debate, it leads in it leads into an issue it leads into a issue that I ha- that I've had with how people treat fantasy as if as if there's this one way that you are supposed to do it that is that European pastiche. And while right. there's nothing while there's nothing wrong with that, um. Obvious, obviously, the Oran Empire, the default um, setting that you have for Axe, isn't play, isn't doing that, and there really is no reason why we why um campaign why campaigns have to be sticking with that pastiche. Just because it's what people have done for the longest time isn't enough of a reason. That's um what we what he what we in the temple call designed by gospel. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Oh, uh, as. I was I was a big I was a big fan of um of of the original Oriental Adventures, just to use my right, just to use my own right. example. Yeah, I love actually Oriental Adventures. I think it's one of the best supplements for Dungeons and Dragons First Edition that was ever published. Um, and I've I've run it as a campaign. It's just it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, I've tr- thought a lot about do I've thought a lot about doing an axe version of that called. Um, a Shigeru Daimyo Shogun, uh, which is set in a foe warring states, Japan, and um, I think that would be, you know, or, yeah. uh, a war, war, warring shogunate uh, Japan. I think that would be so fun. And I remember when Third Edition um, Oriental Adventures came around, and much much like what happened with Seventh C, because this was right around the time when Alderac wanted to try and play both sides, um, doing. Trying to trying to do D and D setup in Rokugan was cute, but it was ne- it was never going to work because um, D and D D and D is still is still very combat centric, and Legend of the Five Rings, where the, where Rokugan takes place, uh, is very much not uh, combat in combat in that is is highly lethal. It's more about political intrigue than than combat, and if you're not putting in mechanics to emphasize that um, political intrigue, which the they barely did, then mm. it's go- then it's going to end up failing. And even the more re- even the more recent attempt with Adventures in Rokugan doesn't have much in the way of the social political intrigue mechanics, despite right. the fact right. that they're that. One of the bit, one of the big archetypes to the point where every clan has a school dedicated to it, is all about um is all about the social mechanics. Right, right, yeah. So I um when I ran Oriental Adventures, I ran it very much like I run traditional Dungeons and Dragons, and I didn't focus in into all of that aspect of stuff. I know there's some folks that love that, and um and I'm sure they have a good time with it. But you know, ours was about exploring Stone Icicle World, which was like this you know, underground cave network where, you know, the spirits of the dead were coming to threaten the living and, you know, fighting against evil sorcerers and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely more of a high fantasy Japan than a realistic Japan as I ran it. So, well, um, um, it's, it's never about a, the reason I bring that I've always heard the whole realistic Japan thing whenever I talk, whenever I talk about Rokugan. Um, and I always have to tell people, if you're if you're looking for that, you're looking in the wrong game because that because you're putting it to a standard that it never wanted to be. But it's right. it's more of doing even doing even doing something like say an ex a West March's exploration. That's not something you can do in that in that kind of setting. Oh. Right, right. And although you know, I mean, doesn't isn't Rokugan the one? Don't they have like that wall? Um, and then like beyond it, it's like this chaotic land ruled by evil. <laughs> That is the one 
place where you could do it, but that is a massive bottleneck. I see. And it's been kind of, um, it feels like that's been de-emphasized in the world, right? Like they, they focused on other aspects of the game more than that. Um, it's, it's more that the, that, um, that is, that is the, the thing, the thing with the wall, which is that, which is that area to the south is more, is more that it's, it's meant, it's meant to provide the central conflict with the crab clan compared and how they see all the other clans. Because each of mm-hmm. each of the clans have their have their own, and I should clarify the great clans have their own agenda, have their own, have their own clans that they like, dislike, and don't and don't tolerate. Um, the key the key with all of it is that for the for the crab they've they've had that particular duty of defending the Caillou Wall to the south. And, I, that's right. yeah. and because of the fact that so much of their time is focused on that, they have no they have a very low opinion of the niceties of the others, especially right. since um their closest neighbor is the crane, who are all about who place a great emphasis on aesthetics and diplomacy. Yes, so, yes, right, right. So you have an oil and you have an oil and water situation. The two have come to blows on multiple occasions, but the key thing, the even though there are elements where you could potentially do a dungeon crawl in that setting, um, it is it's it is not the emphasis, and the times where you could do it are um a ve- are a very specific bottleneck. Um, the most the most famous being the tomb of Iuchiban, which you can run as a standard dungeon crawl, but there's not a whole lot of other places you could ru- you could run in, and you can't you can only you can only run one particular area for for so long. Right. No, for sure, for sure. So, well, I haven't figured out how to solve that in the context of Axe. You know, I um. I secured this license for Chuck Dixon's Conan, so I've been thinking about Hyboria Axe a lot, and so any any plans for more of an Oriental Adventures Axe have been pushed off um, until I sort that out. Yeah. But, you know, Conan has similar uh, elements in that, you know, he does some dungeon crawling, but he does a lot of other things as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I think it'll be be interesting to see how Axe 2 can can simulate that. Mm Mm-hmm. And... It's. I do want. I do want to congratulate you on get on getting that on getting that license. Since um, I will always I will always appreciate having variety in options when it comes to people when it comes to people wanting to do Conan. Mm-hmm. And given 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 the type of campaign setting that you that you had with the Oran Empire, it's a natural fit. I mean, and it. It wasn't something that I was able to cover in my in my review because of the approach I was taking. Uh, yeah. But I definitely appreciate that it that that was going for more of a um, fertile crescent type of type of approach as opposed as opposed to ones that want to act like fantasy begins and ends with the British Isles. Right. Right. I mean, look, I you know I love me some British fantasy, Pendragon, King Arthur, all that stuff. It's all good. Um, it's just, you know, it's been done so much mm-hmm. that um, I wanted to have a, a different approach. And, you know, I was an ancient history major, so I know a lot more about um, antiquity than I know about the Middle Ages. You know, I mean, I, I still know a lot about the Middle Ages, but it's just um, it's not a, not as much. And so dialing into antiquity and the Mediterranean region, I think, um uh, was good. Now that said, I have had a lot of people tell me that they wish that I just did acts set in vanilla European Middle Ages. Um, you know, there's a reason that genre is so commercially successful, and it's because a lot of people like it. Which so. is un- is under is understandable, but at the at the same t- at the same time, um, I get the f- I get the feeling that. The, that um because because of how of how widespread that that genre is, it would be trickier for you to to put your to put your own stamp on it. And the I'd That's say right. the close That's right. 
that's the closest right, yeah. that you came to that was the Heroic Fantasy Handbook. Yes, and the Heroic Fantasy Handbook is something I'm going to be looking to when I work on um, Chuck Dixon's Conan, because um, a lot of the work that I went into that book was in order to simulate a Conan-like world. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's going to be a really valuable asset to me as I go into this um, as I go into this project. Yeah. Yeah. Although, although truth be told, I think the 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 setting that you've that you've done that's the most true that's the most true to form of of that of that old school pastiche is mm -hmm. still um Kanahu. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Although you know, I didn't do that one. Omer yeah. Joel of Stella Gamma created that setting. Mm -hmm. He did a great job. I mean, Omer's a really talented guy. Um, we haven't heard from him in a few days. He's normally very active on our Discord, but he lives in Israel, and so um, we haven't heard from him. I don't know if he lost internet or if he's just laying low or traveling. Yeah. But um, but but Omer's a really good dude, really talented designer, and um, and a really talented world builder. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really loved Kanahu and what he did with it, with like the bug men and uh, the gecko men and the visitor aliens and the nephilim. It was really cool. Yeah, the kind the kind of thing that would be on a would be on a um, album cover for for like the sword. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Oh. Yes. But now, now when it comes to, I mainly remember class creation from the player's companion. I don't rec I don't recall if um spe if spell and racial creation was that was there though. I, though feel free to correct me because it's, it has been quite a, it has been quite a while. But yeah, so spell creation was in the player's companion, mm -hmm. um, but uh, race creation and magic type creation were only previously available in Axioms. Mm -hmm. And with, I do find it, I, I do find it interesting that spell creation is being put in because for some reason that's not that's not a, a road that's ventured all that often, not. Just, it it's barely ventured in the in um, OSR games, and it's only ventured it's only been ventured a handful of times um, outside of that in, in the indie RPG scene. Period. Yeah, um, I think the reason for that is those sort of systems are very easy to break and very easy to um, exploit. Mm -hmm. The way I built um, my spell creation system is a little bit harder to break than uh, than some of the other systems, but you know a dedicated player can still find some pretty exploitative spells, and so uh, that's why we moved the spell creation system to the judge's journal so that the judge is is responsible for spell creation, um, rather than it being a, a, you know considered a player facing mechanic. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it took a lot of work because what I did is I reverse engineered the existing canon of D&D spells. And I figured if those spells had lasted 30 years and people still love them and still, you know, kept them in the various levels that they had been kept in, then probably that, you know, playtesting had proven that these were relatively balanced against each other. And so I reverse engineered how one might, you know, how, mo how one might create each of those spells from that. And... Um, and what I discovered was that I was able to create a reverse engineered system that functioned for about 95% of the spells. But about 5% of the spells were just too powerful for their level, with sleep being actually about a third level spell and fireball being about a fifth level spell. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me the idea that there must be some way for magical experimentation to break the laws of magic and create more powerful spells at lower levels. And so that became the basis of the, of the magical experimentation rules so that you can actually create, you know, really powerful spells. And um, and that's proven really popular. Although it's also, you know, very dangerous for the player character. So some people are hesitant to uh, to do it. You know, it can turn your guy into a hideous, deformed monstrosity or whatnot. It's good stuff. It's good mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, on one hand, I can see that. On, on the other hand, um, well... Welcome to welcome to the wild and wonderful world of 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 invention because well <laughs> so I I ended up I ended up doing a bit of a deep a bit of a deep dive on the early years of in, of aviation and mm -hmm. some of the things that people tried to come up with are definitely weirder than others. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and the same thing applies with the same thing applies when trying to 
I'd, I'd say when trying to research anything in a new invention setup, we in we see in so many different steampunk games where somebody ha where somebody's created an invention that um works in the biggest quotes possible. Um, explosions explosions might occur, you know, the and it's and it's treated as that as that's just the world of invention. So why not visit that in um, fantasy? Right. You know, well, I mean, I did, you know, in, mm -hmm. in By This Axe, there's an entire chapter on inventions. Um, you know, we call them automatons. And, uh, you know, you have a Dwarven Machinist class that specializes in creating them. And you could do full-on steampunk with it. You know, you could do Wild, Will Smith's Wild Wild West or, mm -hmm. you know, Deadlands or any of those things using those rules if, if one wanted to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're very fun. We had a good time creating it. You know, so you've got like a... Uh, you know, you've got like an automaton that's disguised to appear like an ogre that the dwarves can send in Terminator style to go mess up um, Beastman warbands. It's just good fun. It's good fun. Mm -hmm. I'm pr I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure at least one campaign has has devolved into a into a dwarf um um lit littering a littering a battlefield with landmines. I don't know if that's happened, but it wouldn't surprise me. There's definitely a few players in the in the Axe community that are avid avid fans of the Dwarven Automatons and the Machinists. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Probably because they probably because if they're playing Team Fortress 2, they're playing Engineers. Right, same guys. Yep, yep, same guys. And that's cool, right? Like I want Axe to be able to satisfy everybody's different fantasy. I think that makes the game, you know, that makes the game better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with now with that in with that in mind, uh, the one thing I did one thing I did notice in the notes that you had sent that you had sent me is the, is the line is um obviously we have the three different types of um, classes. You have co you have core campaign and demi human, um, right, right? If some yep. if somebody was to expand on that using the class creation setup, what would be the dividing line between say a say a core class and a um, campaign class? Oh, okay, yeah, I can explain that. It's actually really simple. So the core classes, there's six of them. There's one per attribute. So you have mm -hmm. a core class for strength, a core class for intellect, a core class for will, dexterity, constitution, charisma. Mm -hmm. And then each of the core classes covers one of the aspects of Axe gameplay. So, um, you know, you have the arcane caster, the divine caster, you have the dungeon crawling thief, you have the wilderness exploring explorer, you have the mercantile venturer, and then you have the fighter. So... Um, all of the other classes are essentially variants of those six. Mm -hmm. And so so those are called the core classes. And then the variants are, um, for the most part, they're like hybrids or different ways of building similar things. So, for instance, um, you know, the, the Crusader is a core class, and that's a um, divine caster who can fight. The priestess is a campaign class, and she's a non-combatant vine caster. So she has more magic but less combat ability. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're they're balanced against each other. Um, it's just almost every campaign is going to want to use all of the core classes. Not every campaign will use the um, non-core classes. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, and of course, um, demi-human classes. Well, that that is something that. Even if it is in, even if it is somewhat analogous to the to the um, racial classes that were in um, early D and D, um, it manages to avoid one problem, and that is treating ev treat that is. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't a. I'm okay with race as class as long as as long as there are multiple classes for a given race. When it was right. when it was a one on right. when it was a one to one, that was a problem for me. But, yeah, it was kind of limiting, you mm -hmm. know, to have it only be the one thing. My, my thinking is that by having race as class, you actually, um, you really emphasize the uniqueness of the races. And you show that they're different species. They're not just humans in funny costumes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and what's interesting is that, um, you know, Palladium Games basically hit upon the same concept with their racial character classes where they have different, you know, like uh, for the Zentradi, had their own different Zentradi, ra uh, Zentradi classes. Um, 
within the within the Robotech universe, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. So um, mm-hmm. that's the approach. That's the approach we went with. There's like this uh, ongoing meme now that um, that uh, I'm gonna get the riffs licensed because I like riffs. <laughs> I don't think that's true, but you know. no, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's gonna happen any anytime soon. Um, especially. I don't. I don't see. And it was. It was. It was a shock to the system when when I saw a, when I saw Savage Worlds rifts exist into into the world. Um, and don't get me wrong. I, I I know some people don't like that version. I don't. I don't mind it. It's just one more. It's just one more option. Um, yeah. And it is funny you bring up Palladium because of the recent news about them um, bringing back TMNT and other strangeness. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had the very first edition of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when it first came out by Eric Wojcik. Um I knew Eric. Eric was a great guy. Um, I became friends with him when I was when I uh, was in my twenties and work and running the Escapist. And mm-hmm. um, you know, he died tragically very young uh, before he you know before he really had a a, a fair chance. Um, but TMNT is just a fantastic game and. Um, then the, you know how the, their expansions that they did, like after the bomb and road hogs and things, so good, so fun. Yeah, and I've always I've always stated that I've that there are there are plenty of settings that I find interesting within the Palladium Megaverse. It's just the the it's just the presentation of things that is in it, that is an issue. Um. Namely, the, namely the um, navigation. <laughs> I've, I um, right, right, right. I I used to st- I used to study web usability, and because of that, when when navigation gets questionable, it's something I can't ignore. Um, right. And I I remember give I remember giving the guys behind Shiver a, a lot of shit because the PDF the PDF release um did not have bookmarks. Yeah. Yeah, I've made that mistake as well, and to, to my shame. But uh, you know, I'm working on getting better on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you can definitely see there's kind of like an old school, um, you know, throw it all together kind of approach. Like Kevin, an interesting. I feel like Kevin Symbiata and Gary Gygax are actually very much cut from the same cloth in terms of how they think about the world, um, their love for simulation, their enjoyment of sort of some nitty gritty things that other people think are kind of baroque. You know, the big difference is that Kevin Symbiata writes like, um, you know, like a typical Midwestern American and Gary Gygax writes like Clark Ashton Smith. Um, and so they read differently. But I think they, the, the fact that they read differently disguises that at their core, they're probably the two game designers that are most similar in their approach. Like if you think about it, right, Gary mm-hmm. gave us, you know, the weapon versus armor class modifiers and the weapon speed factors and multiple attacks per round with various characters. And then, uh, you know, special rules for pummeling, special rules for grappling, special rules for wrestling. You know, and what's one of the only other old school games you see that has that much um, devotion to melee combat? It's, you know, Palladium Fantasy. You know, um, Gary was the first to give us multiple different types of magic. You know, you see that also with... um, with Kevin's games, there's just there, there's a lot you know the secondary skills right. So for instance, mm-hmm. um, you know you have uh, uh, the skill system in Palladium, which uses essentially a different resolution mechanism than the rest of the game, um, and then you have the same concept of like the secondary skills in in uh, AD and D. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Although um, when it ca- when it came to the... I th- those secondary skills in, in a roundabout way played played a little bit of a factor into some classes have having a bad run of luck, um, and I'm specifically referring to the to the ranger. Mm-hmm. Um, most I'd I jokingly I've jokingly said that part of the, part of the reason the rangers had a bad run of luck, which yeah a lot a lot of people playing fifth edition know that now because it's been rebuilt three times, but. This is not a, but this was never a new problem. Even, um, even the AD and D Ranger had issues. Um, right. But it's the fact that you have an outdoorsy class built in a game, built in a game that's all about, um, dun, that's all about dungeon delving. Um, 
I think that's also the reason why the Cavalier didn't last. Because <laughs> right. it's right. a little hard, right. little hard to bring your horse into a dungeon, and that's kind yeah, that's, that's right. kind of their thing. Yeah, uh, and I know yeah, horse, in general, I think horse classes are pretty tough to make work. Yeah. Uh, I've only been I only made I only made mine work by um che by cheating. <laughs> mm. That for, first off, it wasn't it wasn't a horse; it was a motorcycle, which is mm -hmm. gonna be which is gonna be smaller. And and second off, having it that they get that they can automatically get an item that um, allows them to allows them to carry it in in a more compact package. Um, right right out of the gate, that was that was my way of cheating my way out of that issue. Right. Uh, but there's I'd I'd say the I'd say the big um re the reason for that was. Maybe it's maybe it's just me, but ja but um, jack of many trades archetypes are always mm -hmm. going to struggle whenever you're building them with, in a game that has distinct classes. Yeah, I agree with that. the The exception being if you can find a way to build a jack of all trades type class that is able to exploit a unique synergy, mm -hmm. and then you can get then you can get something interesting. So, like for instance, um. Uh, I feel like um, the uh, uh, example of a, a jack of all trades class that has a unique synergy, you know, uh, the blade dancer in Axe, um, you know, is a divine caster and it's also like a combatant. Um, and you're like, well, do we really need another one of those? You know, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. it's got like some really interesting spell selections that are only available to that class that make them really, really fun and different to play. In, in combat and so like I would totally play that character class versus you know what you saw in a lot of um, other editions of Dungeons and Dragons have been you know jack of all trade classes where you're like well I'm not really good at anything and I'm not sure why I'm playing because my character the kind of the sucks. bar the bard has been my whipping boy for that kind of thing yeah, uh, yeah for sure put, putting aside the fact that people hyper focus on the on the musical instrument part of bards which mm -hmm. I I will maintain you do it it's it's some it's something that is is nice to have, but the idea of a bard needing a musical instrument is is um missing the point. The big the bigger point with bards is that is them being sto them being storytellers, not musicians. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, th th the... that that was a mistake <laughs> in emphasis from the get go. Yeah, yeah. but the bar but the bard they're. They're able, they're supposed to be able to hold their own in a fight, but nowhere near as good as a fighter. They're able to have some degree of skills that they picked up, but nowhere near as mu as many as a thief. Um, mm -hmm. They they're able to they're able to utilize ma utilize magic, but no but um nowhere near as good as, as a cleric, and definitely not as good as a as a wizard. There is there right. isn't that there isn't that one thing that they can do. Um, right, right, and. These that is the type of jack of all trades that I th I think is the um I think is the more the more problematic approach because the archetype of the bard is one that's going to be appealing so when you have it where the, where um they're not, where they're not able to shine in in a specific way um it ends up harm it ends up harming yeah no for sure. For sure. Uh, so, what's your mm -hmm. favorite character? What's your favorite character class? Like, what what do you like to play? I'm curious. Um, <laughs> as my as my name would as my namesake would indicate, I pl I play, I I like to play a lot of um, a lot a lot of monks, but also a lot of um a lot of martial archetypes that ha that have some degree of martial versatility than just basic attack. Um. Mm, gotcha. Did you like the Oriental Adventures monk? I thought it was one of the best versions ever, with like the different martial arts that you could pick and the special yeah, powers and things. I did, and I, I've um, I've frequent I've frequently gotten on people for for act, for acting like martial combat is this one size fits all thing, um, mm -hmm. and it's it's an it's an issue that it's an issue that I ha that I have when the martial character is treated as this one trick pony of just doing basic of just doing basic attack. And for especially from the same people that say fighters aren't supposed to be aren't supposed to be powerful or or have a bunch of 
motifs, and I'm like, is that really the case, or is that something that people have grandfathered in because of years of the fighter being Babby's first character? Yeah, and it's it's not sure. I'm not. I'm honestly not sure. You know, I do th so. There's a there's a game design challenge, which is anytime you provide options in combat, unless you're really really careful in how you build your system to create an intransitive combat system. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is scissors, paper, rock, right? Scissors beats paper, paper beats rock, but rock beats scissors. So there's no right option. Unless you're really careful in how you design your game, typically it works out that there's some option that's always just the best option to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, games that have tried to give you know, oh, you've got four, you know, four different powers you can choose from, and yet people just kind of always default to this same power because it's the best one in most circumstances. That's a really tricky thing to overcome as a designer. Mm -hmm. um, for my own pro for my own project, I've um, the battle cry I've used for to answer that kind of thing is um, is it can be described in two forms. One of them is risk reward, and the other is a game of chicken. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because because there are op there are options that can get that can give you an edge, but that edge is going to, is going to come at a price. Um, like I had done a um, I've utilized a I've utilized a parry system where if you if the dice gods are on your side, you're able to significantly mitigate um damage you might take. If they're not on your if they're not on your side, then you're get then you're gonna end up get you're gonna end up feeling more hurt. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But if but if the if you end up taking that option and the dice gods hate you that day, although that's a bit redundant, the dice gods hate everybody. Mm -hmm. Um that that was your choice that was your choice, so welcome welcome to the consequences. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And of and of course build build of course, once I introduce one mechanic, I'll bu I'll build things around to do, uh, to do other um, modifications of it because I'm a big I'm a big proponent of the of um, something that a a developer at Bungie had said, and I know it I know for some OSR cr folks, it's blasphemy to be br to be bringing in um, anything video game related into tabletop, but I am an I am a natural heretic on that front. Um, he had he had said if you can find thirty seconds of fun, you can stretch that out into a whole game. And a lot of people ended up misunderstanding what he was trying to say with that, because the foc the focus was not um, repeat that thirty seconds throughout, but rather keep iterating on that thirty seconds. Like you look yeah. you look at the first few minutes of Combat Evolved. You st on the Pillar of Autumn, you're in these confined firefights. Then you oh, then then you open up the f then you open up f on um, Halo itself. Mm -hmm. Then you then um you start introducing vehicles. Then you start introducing different um, enemy types that are more advanced, like hunters. And it just keep it just keeps iterating on itself. In the in these little thirty second chunks, that's kind of what he was get that's kind of what he was getting at. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I do think that philosophy can be applied in tabletop game design. Mm-hmm. What would you say is a game you think has done that? Um, that's that's done that's done this particular thirty seconds of fun. Oh, but and and made it work and stretched it out, you know. Um, I would, I'd say, I'd say, in order to make it work, you need you need to have you need to have a design that is very very tight, where everything everything flows into each other. Um. While it's, if I had to use a recent example, while it's not out yet, I would say I would say, um, Cloudbreaker Alliance has done a very has done a very good job with, with how with how um tightly packed its design is, mm -hmm. um. Although paradoxically, it's it's a game that is e that is easier for people who don't have a um le a lengthy background because they're not going to fall into assumptions on how things are supposed to work, um. I'd say bar barring that barring that um I I really did I really um did 
even though even though some people don't care for it, I did enjoy um, Top Secret New World Order, which because ah, okay. it, because it's because it's relying on that rule of thirteen and doubling down on die sizes, it's able to it's able to do a whole lot with it. Um, right, right. The and of course, of course, um, if I if I were to use if I were to use a big example of this kind of thing, I. I'd be remiss if I did not bring up Talos Lanta. Really, uh, Talos Lanta? That's not a game you hear mentioned too often, man. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm partially bringing it up because I'm looking forward to seeing its sixth edition. Originally, the, originally they were going to be doing a D and D five E um hack of Talos Lanta. Then the OGL fiasco happened, and they said, "Screw it, we're doing Talos Lanta sixth edition." <laughs> ah. But. I'd say one of one of the real big ones I can think of that's that is doing this thirty seconds of fun is the is um the saga system. Mm. Um, that was the card based system that TSR did in ninety five that was used for yep. Dragonlance Fifth Age and um Mar and um Marvel yeah. Mm -hmm. Which and uh, admit admittedly, I am a bit biased because I do think that card based design is a a very a very untapped area. Like I don't I I don't think the full potential of a card based RPG has has um been fully explored enough. It's been I completely agree. It's I been explored, agree. but we can do. But I think we can. I think we can go further. Um. And I should I should note that the the common factor with a lot of the with a lot of the thirty seconds of fun is. A concept that I've referred to as "all roads lead to Rome," mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is there's is is having this particular mechanic that is a unifying force with with um everything involved mm -hmm. that everything everything ties back to that mechanic in one form or another, as opposed to like the the very early days of role playing games. That we're still we're still taking their notes from miniature war games where you have a bunch of disconnected subsystems collected collected in a box rather than a unifying mechanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like to you, and what I what I mean by a unifying mechanic is consider say the D10 die pool that you see in World of Darkness. Mm -hmm. Everything, anything, anything that involves anything that involves um, some sort of resolution is using that system. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you don't. Whereas, in, whereas in some in some games you had a set you had a separate system for you have a, you had a separate system for skills you had a separate system for combat you had a separate system for for magic or or a similar thing. Um, and while that while that can certainly work to a point, um. It's what it's one of those th it's one of those it's one of those things that can create problems if, say, you're using di you're using different types of dice for all of them. Or just yeah, or just yeah. different types of res different types of resolution for dice. Yeah. So uh, my take on it, I think. Look, I think universal resolution mm -hmm. systems can be great. Right. Mm -hmm. I used a universal resolution system in um, uh, Ascendant. Mm -hmm. I have um, in. Acts, I have what is essentially a dual resolution system um, with most mechanics using 1d20, but some mechanics using 2d6 on a table. Yeah. Um, and so the d20 mechanic is used for combat and high stress activities where there's really high variability. And so we're simulating the swinginess of battle. And then the 2d6 mechanic, which tends to cluster around results of 6 to 8, we use for things like diplomacy and reactions, where most of the time, most people's outcome is going to be pretty indifferent and neutral. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, one of the things I think people can, can mess up when they design a game is they forget to think about the implications of, of the mechanic that they're applying and how it will... Um, uh, how how it will impact the game world, right? Like, yeah. not not always does everything actually work on a bell curve, but not only does everything work on a d20 either. So, and it's fun. It's funny you bring up the bell curve because of of I have I have um I've I've given 
the I've given the super fans the simp the um stands of Riff not Riff um GURPS a bit of a bit of shit because of the fact that so many of them have the have this almost religious reverence for the um 3D6 bell curve and while don't get me wrong I I enjoy it but it isn't it isn't the um it, it isn't the gospel or the holy grail that some people think it is. Right. Uh, and admit, admittedly, some some of that clowning is just because, oh, um, just because they keep they keep telling me, oh, the, oh, it's the only game you need. You can run it. You can run virtually anything with it. Yeah, you can, if you've if you've got an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of monkeys on typewriters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's true. Okay, I'm, that's a, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I th but the point the point is, if if you're going full universal, that comes with its its own um price. And right. some no, people are it does. Yeah. some people are happy to pay that price, but it is something that you have to be cognizant of. Oh. It is. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yep. 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 Well, listen, man. It's uh, I'm unfortunately out of time. Um, <laughs> we got a little. We got started a little later than I hoped today, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a huge backlog of work to get done before my Kickstarter goes live on Tuesday. All right. Um, once it's know, once it, it's up, I it, will. I, I will put a link in the description. But awesome, thank, thank you. Thank you. Can you, put, you can put the you can put this link here now. It's it's the same link as the preview page. Let me all right. Um, let me just drop it oh, to you, man. But thanks as always for for being open to coming all the all the way to my temple. Um, oh, absolutely. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often tell people, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. That's right. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>